uh, July 2nd, 2014. My name is Ron Carrico, and uh, we're here to discuss uh, Convair. And what you know, give me your full name, sir. James M. Nelson. And where are you from? Originally, North Dakota. And what year were you born? 1933, November you, 17th. What did your parents do? My mom was with the Infernal Revenue, and my dad was a reservist in the uh, South Dakota Army uh, Air Reserve, and he worked with the uh, Corps of Engineers. And in 19... 1952 or so, you went to work for Convair, correct? That is correct. Where? Here in San Diego. How did you happen to come to San Diego? Well, my mom and father got transferred here in 1948. So, 48, you would have been? About 13. About so 33, 38, 15. 15. Okay. So, did you go to college? Mm hmm. Where? I went to San Diego City College, and I went to San Diego State, and I also went to Grossmont. Okay. And so from, um, so now you got a job with Consolidated Voltee, and where, where was that exactly? Right across the field over here, and I started outside of Building 4 on the B-36s. Wow, what did you do on the B-36? I was uh, electrical uh, and uh, instrumentation. So, wh did you have that kind of training from um, your college, or did you get it on the job? I got it primarily on, on the job. Okay. I, I went to college while I was working here. Just out of curiosity, how much money did they pay in those days? I got a dollar and five cents an hour. <laughs> okay. Started outside of Building 4 on the B-36s. Wow, what did you do on the b thirty six? I was uh, electrical uh, and uh, instrumentation. So wh did you have that kind of training from um, your college, or did you get it on the job? I got it primarily on, on the job. Okay. I, I went to college while I was working here. Just out of curiosity, how much money did they pay in those days? I got a dollar and five cents an hour. <laughs> Well, how long did you work for Consolidated Voltique? Let's see, I was with them until 19... Hang on a minute. Let's see. I left there in 57. Okay. Where'd you go? I went across the field to uh, Rhine Aeronautics. Okay, and would you, so when did they stop building the B-36? That would would have been, let's see, I, start, I came here in 52, we finished them out, I believe it was in November of 52. Okay, did you ever because, fly in one by any chance? Yes. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, where'd you go? Uh, just up for a three-hour uh, test hop, I acted as a crew chief for mm -hmm. them. And, and they, they took off from here in San Diego, right? Yes. And then returned back to, to yes. Denver? Unbelievably neat airport. We lost two B-36s while I was here in my early days. Right, right. We lost one right over here at the gun butts, and uh, that was because some jerk, we were getting it fueled, and somebody set a spark or some darn thing, and the fireman that came out to fight the small fire ended up, for why he did it, I don't know, but he shot up and over the top of the fuel truck. Well, when he did that, the water hit the ground and splashed the fire right up into the bomb bay. Mm, wow. And so we lost the whole burden. That was one morning. That was 
probably about six thirty, seven o'clock when we lost that bird. So then there, but they they also lost another one. It was lost off the coast. I know that. Yes, but we had a B thirty six that was in the summer of fifty. Summer fifty two. I think it was August of August or September fifty two. We had a 36 uh, coming back from a flight, and they ended up getting a fire in the uh, port number three engine and couldn't get the darn thing out. So everybody bailed out except the pilot and the co-pilot, and they went down with the plane. And to this day, they're still down there in about 150 feet of water. Hmm. And their wives said, don't bring them up. There were some divers that were going to bring them up at, at one time, and the wives all said, no, leave them down there. So uh, so you stayed there, and then now you went to, you went to Ryan. Yeah. Working on airplanes again. Yes, I worked on their... XC-142. XC-142. That was a tilt-wing cargo. It had twin engines on it. Jet engines, right? Oh, they were four-bladed props. Okay, okay. And, uh, but that was a test airplane, of course. Yeah, we built, let's see, we built two of them. Uh, how'd they work? How'd they fly? Pretty good, all in all. Really? But then they got... They got beat out by something else, and I can't remember what that bird was right offhand. But anyhow, they uh, they uh, lost lost the contract, and then we also built uh, these uh, kind of like a glider. It was a Oh, what do you want to call it? Not really a glider as such, but it had had a cargo box on it. And then as you uh, dropped it, the wings folded out this way and filled up with air, and she would glide down to the ground. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I have a bunch of questions here that, that Bob did for me. Um, now... Okay, so so when you left the 142 project, what did you work on next? And that's when I went to work on the uh, 880s and 990s. Okay, before we get to the 880s and, and the 990s, were you involved in the CDAR program? For a little while, yes. And did you see? And, did you and see the Pogo? And the Pogo. Did you see the uh, the CDAR when it crashed in San Diego Bay? Yes, I remember it when they. I was doing something with a tour of people, and uh, we came down to watch it. And I think part of more Air Force, part of more Navy, and some civilian people. Well, did you actually see it? It blew up in flight, right? Yes. Was it a what they call a uh, pilot-induced oscillation, one of those Whiffer deal what, sort of things? What it did when it took off. It went out through the channel all the way down to South Bay. Right. Then started down the bay like it was going to make a high-speed pass. Right. All of a sudden, there was a boom, and she started splitting apart as she came even with uh, North Island over here where the hangars mm -hmm. Just before the hangars. So where did it? Where did the pieces land? In the uh, bay. They, oh, by by the approximately where the midway is now, for instance, or that's about where it started mm -hmm. to come apart. But then it uh, followed on with more pieces uh, coming out of it, and everything. Uh, about the time it would get. Oh. Right across from the uh, carrier docking right. facility, that's where 
the biggest portion of it came apart and she went into the drink. The pilot tried to eject, but the canopy for some reason was jammed, would not open and the seat came out fine. But he hit his head on the the beam that was overhead mm -hmm. that came down like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ended up, he went down with the plane. And they finally dove on him and got him out, but he didn't make it. Yeah. And it ended up being that some of the fuel uh, lines broke. Mm. And that's what started the plane coming apart. Mm. But she did porpoise and act kind of violent. So now, the uh, I remember the year that was. Was that 55, 56, somewhere in there? That was about, it had been 56. Yeah, okay. I, I can figure that out. So now you were also, what did you actually do on the Sea Dart? I was on the f last station, but just as it got lowered, there were, you had six different stations for it in the uh, experimental hangar area, over which was on this side of Building 5 and 51. Okay, so now, uh, so you did electronic stuff yeah. there. And yeah. Same for the Pogo? You worked on the Pogo as well? Just, uh, I was in Pogo, I was in the packing of the uh, ejection chute mm. on that, and I worked with a lady, and I cannot remember her name, Mary sticks in my mind. So we, I, I understand that Skeets Coleman used to hover the pogo up on the, in the mornings at Lindbergh Field. Did you ever see him do that? Yes, and I saw him down at Brown Field okay. when he was down there uh, in that one uh, hangar area. How many times did you see it fly? I saw it three times. Did it ever go in level flight? No, I never did see it transition to the level of flight. I just saw it go up and back down. Well, I know it did. I mean, I've seen pictures. Yeah, yeah I, I know it did too. I've got a book booklet on the uh, Sea Dart and the Pogo. Yeah, I, I talked to Skeets Coleman last year. I interviewed him. You know, he just passed away about a month yeah, ago. Yeah, that's what you were saying. Yeah, and he, uh, so anyway, I interviewed him, and, and unfortunately, I, did, I didn't keep the interview. I, because he couldn't remember very much at all. But according to him, he never got into level flight. Well, I know he did. I sent pictures of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. He got it into level flight in, in this big space out between 52 and Building 4. We were doing ejection tests on it because he didn't think you could safely get out of that right. darn thing. And... It, it wasn't until the third time that we tried to do an ejection test on it. The other times it would just go so far out of the cockpit. First time it stuck. The second time it just went lifted up and then fell off down on the back side of it <laughs> and didn't go anywhere. Then the third time it finally went up, the chute opened, and it came down fine. And that morning, Skeets uh, told the uh, manager and some other people, he says, I have got to have more money to fly that beast. He says, it's just <laughs> not that safe, and I'm not happy with it. When I asked, After him, the when test, I asked, him, when I asked him how he landed, he went like this. And I said, well, how do you do it? Add power, pull the power off, you know? And just. That's no. all you do, just like that. <laughs> they, they came in at altitude of about, I'm going to say about 500 feet. L lifted up, transitioned, and then just kind of backed it down. Yeah. And the props went into <coughs> a reverse on it. 
Mm -hmm. I wouldn't think so. They'd pull it down faster. Or reverse or something. Yeah. I know they change, change pitch yeah. on him, and he backed down and hovered just the last little bit off from the ground, mm -hmm. and then set it down very slowly on all, yeah. all four wheels. Okay, so enough about skates. Um, now, I'm going to ask these questions in order that Bob wrote these. Before Convair offered the 880 for sale, were they not looking at a two-engine jet as a follow-on to the very successful 340, yes. 440 yes, series? Yes, we did. Okay, what is an, well, I don't even know, what is an 880? 880 was the four-engine uh, first version of the commercial four-engine jet that was demanded by Howard Hughes. By Howard Hughes? Yeah, he he had to have a four-engine jet for, for TWA. For, T, for TWA? Yeah. We built a total of 25 or 20, maybe it was 20, of the 880s for TWA, and then there was also, out of that TWA batch, there was five aircraft that went to went to Eastern, North, no, Northeast Airlines, and they had them on, uh, I'm going to say, Leafs bases. I think they flew those for about two years. So, now what, the, what was the 340 and 440 though? What were those? Those were, we started to look at a 340 for a twin engine jet. And I think on that one we put the jet engines out on the wing tips. We mounted them out there. And that didn't go over too well. So the 340 was a propeller-driven airplane. Was a propeller. Was a and then so, prop. So now the what? So the Convair 440 was what? Was a prop job also, but we took a 440 and we got the jet pods from a uh, B47 and mounted them just in line with the uh, wings and just underneath them. And that was two engines to a pod. So it had six engines? No, we took the props off. The prop part was all gone. We didn't use the uh, recip engines at all. So it, had a, it was a four engine jet? Yes. Two in a pod? Was that that was not commercially sold then? No, that, was just, that was just strictly an experimental look at it. We was looking like at the 340 and the 440 as our next in line uh, aircraft to take over after the props and some of the turbo props were not selling too well. So from that point, we built a mock-up of the 440 with the uh, engines in it. We took the wings and we brought them back just a little bit, I think about, I'm going to say about 20 to 25 degree backward. So does the 880 have, the number have a significance of some sort? Yes, it was. The speed of the aircraft plus the rate of climb. Yeah. And that's what, because before it was going to become called the 600. And they didn't think that with the 707 getting ready to come out, that a 600 uh, designation would sell that well. So the 600 was an indication as to speed and number of seats that was in the aircraft. And the same way with the 
880 was with the speed and rate of climb on it, and so it matched up. So they're basically J47 engines, though? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, after that, so you know, I'm just looking at a picture. It's quite had quite a sweep to the wings. Yes, that was a 37-degree sweep on the wings, on the horizontal stabilizers. Right. And the vertical stabilizer. Huh. The leading edge was at a 37 degree. So they only made 25 of them, though? No. Because we got, let's see, uh, Transworld got, I believe, 20. Delta got. Uh, Twelve or sixteen. Did the military have some? No. Because I, I take that back. I, yes. see a, I see a picture here. Of the one Navy one got the eight hundred and eighty, which they converted to uh, firing the cruise missile with it, and also used it as a uh, in-flight refueler. Yeah, I see a picture of refueling an airplane right here. Yeah, we refueled. Uh, some F-14s with that and... That's exactly what the picture is here. Yeah, and there was a... I forget what the other Navy version, but it, it also was in the uh, test area for refueling. But it, would it be fair to say it was not as successful an airplane as the DC... as the 707? Uh... I mean, it didn't... Uh, it, it didn't quite... Uh, make it the way it was a faster aircraft than the 707. Oh, wow. huh. In fact, one of the examples that we did with the 880 was when we were flying certification with that. We left out of uh, Kennedy uh, Airfield in New York 15 minutes after a uh, 707 had left. And we landed in Chicago 20 minutes before it got oh, there. What year would that have been? That would have been about 19, had been about 1960. So, um, now what was your job title when you were doing that? I was uh, flight uh, electronics and I sat in third officer seat. Okay. Now let's see, now he says, talking about the 340, the two engine jet as a follow on to the three, eight, 340 and 440. So was there a, a twin engine jet they were thinking about building afterwards? After we were wanting to build a twin engine jet, okay. 60 passenger okay. prior to the 880. Okay. What happened? Was it one ever made? We made a mock-up of it. We it never uh, went into flight status or anything. Okay. Because right right after we finished the mock-up and everything, that's when we got into it with Howard Hughes, and he demanded the 880 uh, jetliner, and it would take between. 80 to 127 passengers. So the next question is, what happened? Why did Convair change their plans? Howard Hughes. <laughs> if, we, if we just built the 440, and I forget what we was going to, was flat. The landing gear was moved inboard of the uh, jet pod and then it would fold up into the... Well, is that, is that picture you're looking at there, is that a mock-up of the airplane, or what is that? No, that's a uh, Xantop uh, cargo. So they did build a 640? They did inches. build a 640, yeah. Okay, but it would have competed with the 737, right? If we would have stayed with the jet engines, yes. So in other words, they didn't do this... They didn't we, build very many of those. No, these... Zantop 
Uh, Airplane to compete with Boeing and Douglas. Mm-hmm. Before he'd buy 30 airplanes from Convair for TWA. Yeah. So, and they what did they do? They met his demand to build those airplanes? Yes. And that was the 880? That was the 880. Do you know why Hughes wanted to have the 880 as opposed to buying from one of the other competitors? He he wanted a uh, one that had a could do a short field and everything. Whereas the 707 and the DC-8 at that time were not certifiable to do a short field takeoff and landings so at might, altitude, okay. All right. which we could do with the 880. Okay, so he did buy 30 airplanes then, is that right? Yeah. And then who else Who else bought the airplanes? Uh, Delta bought the airplanes. Uh, let's see, Northeast got aircraft. Japan Airlines got 880Ms. Did uh, Hughes really put guards on his 880 so no one could work on them? He put, he came in one Sunday afternoon when I was here at the field and he taxied up to the gates over here. Flying what? A uh, B-26, which he <laughs> had. And he taxied up to the gate asked if he could come in because he had to take care of some business. I and another uh, person opened the gates for him. He taxied in and turned around, crawled down out of his aircraft, and he had a shirt, a pair of t-shirt, I'm gonna say, and a pair of dungarees and some deck shoes, and he was paint of all different kinds and colors and descriptions all over his clothes. He was also into ships, sailboats, and that kind of stuff. And so he asked that we get hold of the uh, marketing people and the sales people, which we did and they came down and he took out his checkbook and he wrote a check for, we had five TWAs sitting in pits there. And he said that he was buying those five right off the bat. And he wrote a check for those five. And each aircraft, he said he wanted them certifiable and everything but that he was going to put a guard on each one of them. And I don't remember what the reason was, but he had them sit out there and it was cold because it was just about in the end of winter when he did that. And so because of them being cold, he had them call up City Chevrolet down here on Kettner and ordered out five brand new Chevys, told the gentleman that those Chevys belong to them. They needed uh, batteries or anything went wrong with the car, just call City Chevrolet up, have them come out and fix it. But on ship one of the eight of the TWAs that was sitting there, the fence was all around it. Well, after he paid for it, the guys started going to get their toolbox, and he says, oh, 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 wait a minute. He says, I bought everything that's inside that fenced-in area. And he says, that's all mine. And that guys all said, well, that's our tools to work with. And he says, get the tool man out here, and you buy whatever you need to uh, do your work, and so everybody got all new toolboxes, new tools and everything, but we still built the aircraft, finished them out, 
got them in a taxi test, did a uh, check flight on them, and then moved them out to Compass Rose. And they were pickled out there, and that's where they sit till all the aircraft were ready to go. Wow. What year was that? That was in the 58, 59 time frame. And what was your job title then? I was uh, electronics and uh, uh, third flight officer. Or what uh, did you ever meet Hughes yourself? Yes, when he uh, taxied in that uh, Sunday, I got to meet him personally. And what, what were you doing there that day? We were working on on aircraft that okay. day. We was on a <coughs> twelve hour shift seven days a week for two and a half years. Wow. wow. And during that time we buried 48 engineers that died on the job. Really? Yes. From what? Too many hours. Oh. Just burned themselves out. And I had a crew chief that we came in on landing out here in midfield. <coughs> And we had to re replace three tires that blew on that ship one. Hmm. And who were the test pilots? Were they company guys? There was uh, Don Gimrod, uh, Johnny Canable, uh, and who was who was third officer. What do they what do they do on a test flight? Did you ever go up on test flights? We did we did a I went up later but the one of the flutter tests that was done off from uh, St. Nicholas Island and what does that mean flutter test? Uh, it's vibration test on on the vertical and horizontal stabilizers that's and that's when we lost the upper half of uh, vertical stabilizer on ship one and had so this is like really high speed in a dive or something like that yeah and so at that were you, point were you on board when that happened no I didn't get to go with them that day it'd be a good day to not go <laughs> you got that right <laughs> anyhow Don Gimrod and I think Johnny Canaval were there too and let's see there were some test engineers that were sitting in back, and I can't remember who all was there without looking at some of my uh, records and everything. So now, and now there was a 990 program too. What was the 990? 990 was a larger aircraft, and it was longer and faster than the 880. Did it go into production? Yes. American Airlines was the first one that bought the 990, and they were going to buy, I think, 50 of them. They ended up getting 25. And, let's see, Alaskan Airlines also bought one of the 990s. Swiss Air bought 990s. Very so, bought 990s. So first flight 1961, retired 1987. They flew a long time. Yeah. So did you, uh, did you, were you involved in test flights on those? I was on ship one, yes. What, what were you, what was your job title then? Electronics. I just flew in the electronic capacity. It, it says here they built 37 of them. Yeah, because, let's see, uh, like I say, American got them, uh, Northeast got them, uh, Swiss Air got them, Civil Air, no, Civil Air Transport got 880Ms, Vera got 990s, uh, Aero OY got uh, some 990s. See that. A bomb blew up one of them in Switzerland. Uh, no, bomb blew up on them in 
over Vietnam. Well, there's there's one in Switzerland too. Wow, well, I am not aware of that one. I know we lost one over Vietnam on, on uh, Vietnam of uh, uh, Cambodian uh, border. It was uh, sabotage. All went down. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let's see. Now, so you must have left Convair then. Let's see, that was in 63 when I left Convair. And, and you went to where? I went up to Boeing. Aha. Uh -huh. What did you do at Boeing? I was in flight test program on the 727s. And the 737-100s. Oh, really? So now we're talking 19... So now you're 30 years old now. 30, 31 years old. Okay. So you you ended up flying... So what were you, your same job? Flight test or...? I was in the flight test department, but I did their electronics and uh, when you talk, cockpit. When we, talk, when we talk about electronics, what are you talking about specifically? Oh, the... Uh, the control wheel... The uh, fuel gauges, uh, lighting, radio. So making sure they works, but not necessarily working on a component itself. Okay. Yeah, no that 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 was uh, that w was part of the radio radio and electronics department, and they. Uh, certified all the radio gear, the two nav uh, navcoms and the uh, CCAL. So how long how long are you with the, with the, at Boeing then? Oh gosh, no, I don't think I was there more than about maybe nine months. Mm, okay, and then you you must have come back here again then, right? No, I went from there down into a design status on the C-5A program at, for Lockheed. Really? Yeah. Oh, for Lockheed. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, where, where, where would that have been? That was down at Roar. That's here? Yeah. Oh, okay. And we built the uh, pods and myself and one other engineer, we did the pylons. So we're not, were you an engineer by this time then? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, did you eventually graduate from college then? Yes. Where where from? San Diego State. So you were working uh, uh, you were working at the same time as going to school then? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm just looking up something about the C five A. The uh, I'm I'm looking at here so so how long were you so how long were you there with that with that with Lockheed then? Uh, again about between six and nine months. Yeah, it says your first flight of the C five A was nineteen sixty eight. Wow, it's been that long. Huh? Oh, yeah. Geez. In fact, we had I think it was ship one. No, ship two of the eight eighties. We took off in the morning and the flat and flap tracks jammed. We're talking about the 880 or the C5? C5. Okay. The, well, your flap tracks were here coming down and you had rollers in them. The uh, rollers and the flap tracks had zero tolerance on them. They were built and designed by over in England. By I think it was Arrow over there. Anyhow, they put such a tight tolerance on the darn things that when they warmed up, they jammed. Mm -hmm. they, oh they selected 30 degree down flaps for takeoff. The flaps came down and jammed at three degrees. Indicators wound down until they showed that they were at 30 degree flaps down, but they never reached that. So as a, and the field there at Dobbins was only 10,000 feet 
long. Oh boy. And they cleared the ground at 8,000. It broke ground, making it pretty damn short. They cleared the chain link fence at the end of the runway by about six feet. <laughs> Flew over uh, Townsend uh, Shopping Center and the chase plane told them that they didn't have but about three degrees or five degrees down flat. And they said, well, we're indicating 30. And he says, well, you don't got it. So they continued out and then they turned, circled the field, went about 50 miles downstream and then started their letdown and landed on, on the runway about probably at about 4,000 feet, 3,000 feet, something like that. And then stopped the aircraft and taxied back. And that aircraft, when she was taxiing, it sounded like a fire truck running. The engines were so shrill on her. I wonder why. I don't know, but every, every time they took off or landed, you swore to God that there was a fire someplace and that the fire trucks were running. Oh, it's, yeah, that's the big fan engines, I guess that's it. I don't know, I don't know much about them. I know they were big because we guesstimated that them and the 747, we could drive a Volkswagen into them. They were that big in diameter. They're bigger than that. <laughs> they made 137 of them, and they, it looks like they've lost very few of them. I was kind of surprised. Actually, quite few, quite few they lost. Yeah, I was just, and, you know, I was just reading here on this on my cell phone here. So, okay, now you were with them for a while, and then you somehow became an early Atlas missile testing. Where was that? I did that at uh, San Diego here. Working for whom? Uh, GD, uh, GD Space Systems. Okay, now, I, I always get confused about it. So Convair, was that part of General Dynamics? Yes. And then Atlas became, is another part of General Dynamics? Yes. Okay. Hmm. okay. G, that was called GD Aerospace. Okay. What did you do there? I worked liaison on final assembly on that bird and then also worked on the Centaur program for Convair. We built two uh, Centaurs. Did you ever get to see them fired off? Yes. Where did they fire them off from? Cape Canaveral. Oh, so you went down there to watch them take off? Yeah, I was, I was sent down there as, to work on them for a while in the launch team. Okay, this, so as, a, as an engineer at this point? or. I was a, as an engineer at that time. Okay, what year would that have been? That would have been... About 72, 73 time frame. Okay, so... I, I was down there. I don't know much about these things. Okay, Centaur rocket. We built them in Building 4. Is Building 4 still there? No. All of the buildings at uh, GD Space are gone here in San Diego. Really? I know there's still a lot of buildings down there. So. Well, a lot of them, we had GD Aerospace, we had GD Electronics, and GD, I think GD Test. Anyhow, we did some of the, we built the air, the Centaurs, two of them, and I can't remember the other name, but they did go fire and get sent into space. It says here there was an up, it was, there was a rocket stage designed for use as the upper stage of, of space launch vehicles. Yes, so that, it says it was 10 feet in diameter and 
41 feet long. That's a pretty big device. Yeah, that, that went on top of... Uh, let's see, who built that... Uh, that bird? I know we mounted it on top of them. It says the manufacturer was Boeing IDS, United Launch Alliance. Yeah. And then it says Atlas was used, Atlas Centaur. Was put on top of that. Right. We did two of them, launched them out into space, and I don't, I think one went out as far as uh, Jupiter, and I think the other one went beyond Jupiter. Nope. There's a question here about life science testing. What was that? It says you were involved in some of the early Atlas missile testing. Describes some of the life sciences testing. We did uh, some of the communications between the uh, satellite that uh, Gemini, mm -hmm. in which we did. There was four of us that worked on the system, and we would send out a signal to, like Apollo. Mm -hmm. They would, in turn, do whatever they needed, and they would zap it back to us, and we received it in a uh, unit that. Uh, received it all in code and then translated it from that where it came in and hit this mirror went down and then we had all our decoding mm -hmm. apparatus let me move forward we don't have a lot of tape left here so okay um, yeah. when, now you, when, you went to work for United Airlines what did you do with United Airlines I was a uh, third officer for United for okay. for a while, and then I also was a rep for okay. Convair. So, and then, and that, what other kind of testing were you involved in? Uh, I was uh, involved in the uh, launch up at Vandenberg. Oh, really? What was launching the Minutemen up there, or what launches? I don't even know. Uh, Atlas uh, launches, and also. Uh, launches from Cape Canaveral. So, what did you do for the launch? Prepare the bird, or no? I, I was in the blockhouse. What did you do there? Uh, just mainly uh, tracked it as it uh, went up and kept tabs on the uh, communications. Well, the communications you mean between people or between the bird? Be between the bird and. The blockhouse. How did it? What kind of a? What? How would it do that anyway? What frequencies were used? Is it? Oh gosh, you got me there. I don't remember what the frequency was on it. But how long could it talk? To, I mean, it's a ballistic missile. Doesn't it just kind of go off and then that's pretty much the end of it? Well, to that aspect, yes. But then when we started working with the Gemini and the Apollo program, that's when we had. To, more the voice communications. So when was your, so let's see, you're what, 81 now, right? I'll be 81 in a couple of months. And I finished up in on the uh, Atlas II program up at Vandenberg. When was that? Uh, that was 89. So so then after then after you were just with United Airlines after that then? No, that was actually United where I was rep to them was on the uh, 340s. When we were building them up over in building four we had. Oh so so okay, so you were working with United Airlines for building the three forties back in the fifties? Yeah. Oh okay. And we actually had one that lifted off the ground in uh Ames, Iowa, and that bird lifted off, and for some reason, the engines quit, and she bellied into a cornfield. When it bellied in there, then no forward of the wing attach point, 
that point broke off. Mm -hmm. Then you had the wings and the center section and the aft section of it broke off at wing attach. Mm -hmm. Those that we sent a crew back there, they totally took the horizontal stabilizers off, the vertical stabilizer, the wings separated all the fuselage parts and stripped her out, loaded her onto uh, four flat cars and brought it back here to Convair and it was offloaded from outside of building seven. The wings went to building three for reconditioning. The fuselage all went to uh, building two to the canoe sections and they put new canoe sections in it and did final assembly where they brought all three pieces together, reassembled it, brought it out to a flight test at the flyaway zone and checked her all out and delivered it back to uh, well, you've had a lot of interesting uh, experiences with uh, flight test, and uh, I, and I learned a lot about Convair. I never, these guys talk about Convair out here all the time. I know nothing about it.